Good morning. I was uncertain when I left home in Rancho Bernardo down by San Diego about whether how long it would take me to get here. Uh, it was really foggy at my house, which is about seven or eight miles inland from the coast as the crow flies. And I thought by the time I got to the coast, I might be socked in. But God was good. By the time I got to the coast, it was bright and sunny and just a few light patches of fog. To God's chosen people who are here today, God planned long ago to choose you by making you his holy people, which is the Spirit's work. God wanted you to obey him and to be made clean by the blood of the death of Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Amen. Until Wednesday, I was working on another sermon. <clears throat> but it just seemed like we needed to address another issue. Do not be alarmed. I received a phone call Tuesday or Wednesday from a friend saying to me, Pastor Gary, I have a co-worker who came to me and they said, do you realize that the war in Israel is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy? We need to start getting our act together. Basically, that's his comment. He said, it disturbs me that we've got to wait until some event to try and say we need to get our act together. Does it disturb you too? He said, this, this co-worker never talks about spiritual things any other time. He said, there's something wrong with that picture. How do you see that? And we talked about it. I gave my views. There's no question that we're living in a world that is truly messed up. We're going through a very troublous time, correct? I mean, there is so much hate in this world at a time when human beings think that they got the answers and the more answers they try to, to discover, the more questions arise, the deeper the hatred gets and we become more and more inhuman to one another. Not only are we continuing to deal with the war between Russia and the Ukraine and all the hurt and killing and maiming and displacement of people, but now we are dealing with the war between Israel and Hamas and perhaps other nations entering in. And now, towards the end of the week, there is the South North Korea, excuse me, North Korea threatening to use nuclear war against our country. How do you handle that? There's been a warning that parents should be careful of what their children are seeing on social media because so many of the, the videos are so graphic and so many of the stories are so graphic. Pleading that we need to protect our children, not just the little ones, but the older children, the youth as well. How do you handle that? I remember when I was eight years old, I may have told this story before, I've used it more than once, but it bears repeating. I was eight years old, we went to an evangelistic series in Flint, Michigan. And one night it talked about the end of the world and Jesus preparing for Jesus coming and the signs and the wars and the rumors of wars, tribulation and all that. And that night I went to sleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up in tears, shaking like a leaf because I'd seen a vision. I was out standing in my family's garden plot in the cornfield, interestingly enough. And I saw a cloud like a fist coming and getting bigger and bigger. And those of you who study the Bible know what that's supposed to mean. And I looked and I cried out, not yet, not yet, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> Anybody else have that experience or something similar? So how do you handle end-time prophecies and end-time events? Do you, when you hear about end-time events or end-time prophecies, do you look at them with anticipation of Jesus coming or with apathy of, well, I've heard that before? Do you look at it with assurance knowing that because of Jesus you have the promise of salvation or do you look at it with terror because 
I'm not ready yet. Do you look at them with joy because this tr world with all its troubles and tribulations will be soon done away with and we will be living in heaven where there will be no more sorrow, no more tears? Or do you look at it with fear because you're afraid that uh, you might not be there? Or because of what you might have to go through before Jesus comes? Do you look at it with hope? Not just a hope against hope, but hope the hope of biblical certainty that Jesus will come soon, or do you look at it with hopelessness of, I can't do anything about it anyway? Do you look at it with excitement, or do you look at it with skepticism? Do you look at it with faith, trusting that God will see you through, or do you look at it with doubt? Will I be able to make it through? No, it hasn't happened today, but in times past, when an event like what we've experienced this week would take place, church's attendance would spike. Remember back in the, the six, seven, six Day War, 50 years ago, attendance spiked. After 9 11, attendance spiked, but we didn't have the technology where people could just stay at home and watch it on TV and say, I went to church. That was an intended statement. So we may not see the spike this time. Or maybe the apathy has set in overall. But I think that leads us to the question. What did Jesus say about end time events? How did Jesus view them? And what did Jesus have to tell us about how we should respond to end time events. The most obvious place to look is Matthew chapter 24. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be doing a forest versus trees approach. When we look at this chapter, we usually look at the, tree, the trees. We usually dissect it and say what he was referring to and where he was referring to it and when that will take place. And, and, and we should do that. But sometimes we need to look at the overall picture. There's a beauty in the forest of how the forest fits together, not just with the trees, but the animals, the flowers, the brooks, the waterfalls, right? And so we're going to look at the forest, and I'm not going to cover every verse in this chapter, and even in chapter 25, so if you didn't read it before you came, you might want to read it this afternoon in light of our message today. But the question becomes... How did Jesus, what did Jesus say about the end times? How did he treat end time things? And so we're going to look not at Matthew 24 first, but we're going to look at Matthew 23 because leading up to Jesus' statements about the end times, it began with, the, with Jesus teaching in the temple. And in Matthew 23, verse 37, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Now, the next verse is crucial. See, your house is left to you desolate. Now, what house is he referring to? There's only one house it can mean. He's referring to the temple. And we lose sight of the fact sometimes that in the thinking of Jesus' day, and the disciples had this in mind, the Messiah was going to come to what? To the temple. And when he came to the temple, <coughs> excuse me, the nations would come and worship at that temple. And from there, he would lead a rebellion against Rome, and God would once again restore Israel to prominence. Because the temple was there at the center. This must have created a huge quandary for the disciples. I mean, think about it. You've thought the Messiah is coming to the temple. The nations are going to gather around. They're going to worship there. And Jesus is the Messiah who's going to make it happen. And he's saying, no, you've got it wrong. This house will be desolate. They must have just gone nuts in their mind. Their mind must have been reeling. Yours would have, and so would have mine. 
What's it like when something you've believed in all your life, you suddenly discover it's not the way it seemed to be? It throws you, right? And so the disciples are in this quandary. And then as Jesus is leaving the temple and going away, his disciples following him, as they're leaving, they point to the temple. Now it doesn't say what they said, but it's not too hard to read between the lines. Jesus, do you see this magnificent temple? How can you say it's going to be desolate? We've pinned our hopes on you as the Messiah. We've pinned our hopes on the fact that this temple will be the place where all nations will come. Jesus, you couldn't have meant it when you said it would be desolate. You must have meant something else. But Jesus answered them, it says, and said, You see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. They must have been crushed. Have they followed Jesus for nothing? They must have been crushed. And then they made their way to the Mount of Olives. And in verse 3 of chapter 24, it says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and they asked the question. Actually, they asked two questions in one sentence. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? I want you to notice when they're talking about end times, two things. The end of the age. The end of the age is, took place in the New Testament from the time Jesus died and rose again all the way through to the second coming. The Bible refers to the end of age all the way from when Jesus died and rose again to the second coming. They didn't see it that way. But that's what Jesus was referring to. And so they asked the question, actually two questions. First of all, when will these things be? When are you coming back? When are you going to establish the kingdom? And what will be the signs? What will be the signs? What kind of signs? I want you to notice that in Matthew 24, Jesus kind of gives three groups of signs. In Matthew 24, he first of all gives general signs. And we'll look at some of those. These are signs that will take place from the, the very time when he died and rose again all the way up to the second coming. He gave some specific signs about Jerusalem, the fall of Jerusalem, and Bible scholars debate why he did this and intermingled them because they were looking at the temple and asking what's going to happen to the temple. So he was answering all their questions. And then there are the signs of the second coming that will take place at the very end. So Jesus is talking about the signs. Now I, I want you to notice that Jesus starts out by answering the what of their question. What will the signs be? In, in Chapter 24, verses 4 to 14, and we will look at this for a few moments. Jesus answered them and said, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. He said there will be false messiahs. He went on. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. I want you... Wars and rumors of wars. If you study history at all, there is hardly a time when war has not been taking place somewhere in this world. Whether it's between nations or whether it's between tribes or whether it's between factions in a country, war has always been the norm. But he says, do not be alarmed. We'll come back to that. The end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Not only has there been the war this past week, but then there was also the earthquake in Afghanistan, right? We hear about it all the time. We hear about more of it because of what we can do with technology. He says, all these are the beginning of the birth pains. Now, for those of you who read the King James, it says beginning of sorrows. That's because... In that day when King James was written, you didn't talk about birth and childbearing. Women went into seclusion when they became pregnant, okay? Birth pains is the way it was written. 
Why? Well, obviously, I've never been pregnant. I was there when my wife gave birth to, to our two children, and I watched her go through it. And from my Lamaz class instruction, I still remember that it's supposed to start out kind of mild pain, longer intervals, but as you get closer and closer to the moment of birth, it's supposed to get stronger pains, closer intervals, until it's really, really bad. Hope I hit it right. I had a friend who was talking about this with, with some ladies, and he said, well, I, I had a, a kidney stone a while ago, and I was told it's about the same amount of pain as a woman giving childbirth, and all the women looked at him and said, out. <laughs> okay? But, but the metaphor is good, because what it's saying is, from the time when Jesus died and rose again, up until Christ comes, all these wars and famines and earthquakes, they will become more and more frequent and more and more intense as we get closer to the coming of Jesus. And that has been true, has it not? Jesus doesn't stop there, and I'm not going to go through every verse. You can read them later. But in verses 9 to 14, he talks about the fact that there would be tribulation and persecution. He said that there, people would fall away from the faith. He said there would be false prophets leading people astray. He said there would be an increase in lawlessness and that love of many will go cold. And it's easy to say, wow, that's happening in the world. But I would remind you that Paul in 2 Timothy 3 said that lawlessness and the lack of love for one another would take place within the church as we get closer to the end of time. Because people will have a form of godliness and deny its power. Doesn't stop there. He says, fortunately, but those who endure to the end will be what? Will be what? My goodness. We'll try it one more time. Will be what? Saved. Thank you. That should excite us. And then the end will come. Now, when I was young and starting out in ministry, that phrase, the gospel will be given to all the world and then he will come, I thought, we got a ways to go yet. There's places that haven't heard about him. In our society today, with our technology and YouTube and TikTok and all of that stuff I never look at, um, surely most of the world has heard about Jesus. But I have to leave it up to God whether or not it's fulfilled or not. But what's interesting is after talking about the what of the signs, what the signs will be, Jesus dismissed their question of when. Have you ever noticed that? He completely dismisses it. Notice what he says in verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, nor the Father only. No one knows the time. And so if we get all caught up and he must be coming soon and, and we need to believe he's coming soon, our lifespan is this short. Mine's getting much, much shorter. He's coming soon for all of us one way or another. And, and so Jesus says no one knows. He dismissed their win. And then he begins to answer a question they didn't ask. In the rest of chapter 24 and in chapter 25, Jesus focused on their attention on how they should endure till he comes. They didn't ask how, but he told them how anyway, because I think for Jesus, how we endure is more important than what the signs are or when he's coming back. Do you catch my point? How we wait is more important then knowing every sign and being able to put it down and, and, and studying the signs is a good thing unless that's all we study. And so Jesus is in, concerned with how we wait. And so he focuses their attention on that. And he, focus, he gives us two commands, the disciples and us. In verse 42, he says, Therefore keep watch. Because you do not know. 
You do not know on what day your Lord will come. What does it mean to keep watch? Well, there were watchmen on the walls that would watch for the enemy approaching. That's part of it. But I think Jesus had two things in mind. Yes, watch the signs. Know what's going on in the world around us because they point to him coming, right? But also, he said, keep watch. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked the disciples to watch with him, to pray with him, to focus with him, to be aware of the, the, what was going to take place next. I, I think when Jesus tells us to keep watch, he's saying we need to be aware of signs, yes, but we need to be looking for Jesus coming into our life every single day. We need to be studying the Bible to see how Jesus wants to interact in our lives and work through us every single day. And then he gives the second command, verse 44. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Let me tell you what it does not say. It does not say get ready. It says be ready. I gave a sermon on this in my church at Corona, and I got a scathing letter from a member saying, we have to get ready. I remember it, back in the day when parents could leave their children who were 10, 11, 12 at home or older and not worry about it. My folks would go out to the grocery store or something after supper, and they'd say, okay, now clean up the dishes, and we want them done when we come home. Stupid me. I thought playing was more important. So I play with my brothers, and I was the one primarily responsible for the dishes that day. Play with my brothers and my sister, and then I looked at the clock and noticed it's getting late, and I better hurry up and get the dishes done. I didn't get the dishes done. And I received the consequences of my actions or inactions. Getting ready implies that you've got to do something in order to be ready. Jesus didn't say get ready. He said be ready. How are we to be ready? Ah, two or three ways. But Jesus then, Jesus then tells three parables in a row that we often study individually, but they really are linked. I want you to notice, he told three parables of what it means, how we should wait, and how we should be ready. The first one is the parable of the wicked or unfaithful servant or the faithful servant. Remember that? I'm not going to read the story. But he tells a story about a, a, a master who went away and left a servant in charge to rule the household and told him that he was to feed the rest of the servants and the rest of the people in the household and take care of them. And the faithful servant did that. But the unfaithful or or, or the evil servant, instead of feeding them, he didn't feed them, he beat them, and he went out carousing while he was waiting for the master to return. So when the master came, he wasn't ready. And the people he had mistreated were able to tell the master how they mistreated them. And he reaped the consequences of his actions. He wasn't watching for his master to return. He wasn't taking care of the master's household. And what Jesus is saying to you and to me is that we are to be taking care of God's business, caring for others, serving others, and watching for him to come back. That's the first parable. The second parable is the parable of the ten virgins. Because the question would rise out of that first parable, well, how are we supposed to feed everybody? How are we supposed to take care of everybody? In the parable of the ten virgins, it's you do that by having the oil of the Holy Spirit in your lives so that your light can be shining while you're waiting for Jesus to come back. Do you catch the significance of that? He doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. He gives a third parable, the parable of the ten talents. In the parable of the ten talents, the master gives different talents, different, or different servants, different amount of talents for them to increase and to be used in building up the, the household's business. And you know the story. 
One of them, two of them doubled what was given to them, even though they were different amounts, but the one with just one talent said, I'm going to hide it because what could I do? You see, what, what Jesus is saying when you connect these parables, he's saying, you're only going to be able to use these talents and multiply them if the Holy Spirit is in you. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you might as well hide the talent because what you're going to do won't work anyway. And so he calls upon us and he says, while you wait, you will need to, to recognize you're, you're in charge of, of, of c- conducting the family business, God's kingdom business. And you can only do that if the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you. And when the Holy Spirit's dwelling within you, God will multiply the talents you have so that you can do more. Do you see the connection between these parables? And then Jesus gave them the right motivation for how they should wait. The motivation is really about being people of compassion. Remember, he ends by saying that he will separate the sheep and the goats. Well, for, for mo- many years, I thought, well, that won't be hard. Sheep look like sheep, and goats look like goats. Big deal. The problem is, in, in Palestine, in Israel, the sheep and the goats look quite a bit alike. And it's the shepherd who knows the difference because he knows them by name. John 10 tells us that. And so the the sheep and the goats can be together and only the the shepherd can divide them. That's an important point, is it not? And so he says he will divide, well, the question becomes, how is he going to divide them? How is he going to know who the sheep and the goats are? He tells them very simply, listen, when you give water and food and clothes and out of compassion you meet the needs of other people, you'll be doing it as unto me. Lord, when did we give you water? When did we give you food? When did we give you clothing? When did we visit you in jail? We never did. When you do it to the least, you do it unto me. I I chose this picture because I hope you can see it. Yeah, you can see it, but notice the sign above the people who are, apparently it's a church, they're serving Uh, passing out food probably to homeless people and it says serve like you are serving a king with the k what capitalized serve like you are serving the king the motivation is grace that the compassion mercy and grace of god has become part of our being out of our relationship with him Pastor Gary, what does that have to do with not being alarmed at all this? I get it. Of course we're going to be concerned. We should be. Of course the, those atrocities upset us. They should. I think they upset God. Of course we're going to feel uncertain as to what the future holds. We don't know the future, but we know who holds the future, right? What does it have to do with not being alarmed if we're doing what God says we should be doing while we wait, what Jesus told us we should be doing while we wait, we will find fulfillment and meaning and purpose that will overshadow any fear we might have. I want to close with a reminder. A reminder that Jesus gave First he gave it at that time, but later he would tell the disciples at the Great Commission, when he gave the Great Commission, lo, I am with you always, even to what? The end of the age. But in Matthew 25, verse 34, it says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Take your inheritance. Jesus ends the story with the assurance that those who are faithful, those who have the Spirit, those who allow the Spirit to work in and through them will be the ones who can face the end of time with assurance because Jesus is faithful and he will always be with us.